Before I introduce our speaker, uh, let me just remind you about two other upcoming events. There is an <coughs> Arthur Lower uh, workshop next week, I think on October 9th, uh, and the Sherwood Memorial Lecture is on October 25th. Um, so please look up the new and improved History Department uh, events page and look for uh, regular emails, updates on these events. So our speaker today is Professor Christopher Brown, uh, Professor of History at Columbia University, and he is a distinguished uh, historian of 18th century Britain and the early modern British Empire. Uh, Professor Brown has written extensively on the history of anti-slavery, ab abolitionism, and the abolition of the British slave trade. So having received a, a Rhodes Scholarship in 1990, Professor Brown completed his uh, doctoral studies at Oxford and uh, afterwards taught at Rutgers for six years and Vanderbilt and um, finally took up a full professorship at Columbia University. He's the author, most famously, of a highly acclaimed book, uh, Moral Capital, Foundations of British Abolitionism, which uh, I know that many of you know of. I remember one year in 2009, um, we were teaching that book in three separate courses <laughs> in our department. Um, the book actually has radically changed the scholarship on abolitionism, and after the publication of Moral Capital, it's impossible now to write a history of abolition and abolitionism uh, from an internalist perspective. You have to take an Atlantic perspective. So he successfully weaves together the story of the American Revolution with the story of the British abolitionism. The book won uh, Frederick Douglass Prize, uh, Maurice D. Fortress Prize, and James A. Rowley Prize of the American Historical Association. More recently, uh, Professor Brown has written with Philip Morgan and published uh, Arming Slaves from the Classical Era to the Modern Age. And today's talk is taken from a new project, a new book. We describe it as a book talk without a book. Um, this is um, a new project on um, British colonial enterprises in the Atlantic world in the west coast of Africa. Uh, we are very happy that you are here with us today. Please welcome Professor Christopher Brown. Thanks so much. Uh, so the first thing I want to say is that this is the first talk that I have given since I left university administration. I spent the last uh, five years working in the provost's office uh, doing various things for uh, Columbia um, and rather less for uh, teaching and scholarship. So I'm really happy to be <laughs> back to doing the real work. Uh, and I have a lot to say this morning. Um, hopefully not too much to say, um, but I want to cut the preliminaries um, and get right to it so that there's a little bit of uh, time for discussion afterwards. Tens of thousands of Englishmen went to West Africa, went to the West African coast during the era of the Atlantic slave trade. Yet as things stand, we know almost nothing about them, who they were, what they experienced, what they made of what they witnessed, what became of those who chose to stay in Africa or were forced to do so. There are, it's true, several elegant accounts of particular individuals and specific voyages. Generally, the, the literature on the Atlantic slave trade prefers the broad view, the macroscopic perspective. Attention concentrates often on those things that may be counted or calculated, morality rates, sex ratios, population flows, profits, capital accumulation. There's now two very good scholarship on the formation of ethnicities in the African diaspora. The lived experience of the trade, though, both for its operators and for its victims, still remains far more elusive. My talk today concerns the history of the first British colony in, on the West African coast the British province of Senegambia, first instituted in 1758, and then dissolved in 1784. This is a preview of a book that I'm writing on that subject, The Rise and Fall of That Colonial Experiment. The book recommends a shift in priorities from the history of numbers to the rendering of experience, from the study of the Atlantic slave trade in the aggregate to the reconstruction of workaday relations between Africans and Europeans 
that made the trade go. In doing so, it participates in a much wider effort, now underway in several quarters, to explore the human dimensions of this subject, to detail the operation of the Atlantic slave trade in discrete moments, and in particular, African ports. Yet it departs from much of this work by opening, as well, a key chapter in a very large and largely neglected subject, the experience of Europeans in Africa in the era of the Atlantic slave trade. Even experts, on, even experts on this era know little, if anything, about the province of Senegambia. Its history, indeed its very existence, has escaped notice even in the most detailed accounts of the Atlantic slave trade, the British Empire, or the pre-colonial histories of Senegal and Gambia. I found the subject accidentally while researching the early history of Sierra Leone some years ago. As I worked through the origins of the British Free Settlement there, established in 1786 as a refuge for black uh, loyalists um, following the American Revolution, I discovered, much to my surprise, that Sierra Leone was the second attempt at African colonization, not the first. During the Seven Years' War, the British military in 1758 seized important French trading posts in Senegal and Gambia. To discourage the return of French traders and to declare British command of the, um, of the project, Parliament designated the newly claimed territories a British province. This early experiment in the colonization of Africa failed almost entirely, primarily because of African opposition to British ambitions along Senegal, as I will explain. A colony in name more than in fact, its short-lived history indicates the li limits of British influence on the Atlantic coast of a Africa. This record of failure explains, in part, why the experiment remains unknown to both historians of Africa and historians of the British Empire. Neither tends to emphasize the history of thwarted European ambitions. The origins, then, of nothing in particular, the province of Senegambia seems to stand apart as a curiosity, an anomaly, a colonial experiment that left no legacy. Uh, West African Roanoke. Yet these qualities, its singularity, its fragility, its apparent insignificance, give the province of Senegambia special value to the study of Europe's Africa trade in the 18th century. For its history calls attention and gives access to dimensions of that subject that the present literature on the Atlantic slave trade finds difficult to explore in detail the history of European-African diplomatic relations, the character of everyday struggles to reckon with cultural difference, the political and economic consequences of geographic ignorance, the ebb and flow of European competition, in particular African markets, the relationship of the trade in African tropical commodities to the traffic in African bodies, what life in Africa meant to men who went there to seek their fortune, to prove their work, prove their worth, rather, to eke out a subsistence or to survive and go home. April 23rd, 1758, early Sunday morning. Fourteen British ships set anchor at the mouth of the Senegal River. <coughs> Led by two naval warships, bearing more than 200 marines and 500 seamen altogether, this was a small force when compared with the other naval expeditions that the British government launched during the Seven Years' War. In West African waters, though, it constituted the largest expedition sent to that coast in at least a half century. An unusual mixture of merchants and military men sat at the helm. At the helm. Commodore William Marsh directed the flotilla, half of which the cotton magnate Samuel Touchett had custom built for this expedition. Major John Tufton Mason, veteran of the 1745 Louisbourg Conquest, the favorite son of a distinguished New Hampshire family, and a, and a veteran uh, commanded the Marines. The most interested party aboard the venture was Thomas Cumming, raconteur and peripatetic man of business, who conceived the scheme and stood to profit immensely if it succeeded. They had come to take the island of Saint Louis, from the French East India Company and control trade in and out of the Senegal River. If all went well, the French posts further upriver 
at Podor in Gaul would fall in turn. Then they hoped the French island fortress at Gore, not much further south, would surrender too. In the river, along the shore, and on the island of Saint Louis, the residents of the lower Senegal Valley measured the likely consequences of a British takeover. For the political elite on the mainland, for the leaders of Walla, the appearance of the Royal Navy at the Senegal Road offered a challenge and an opportunity. They knew that British occupation of Saint Louis would unsettle the region's politics and in ways that would be difficult to predict or to control. They knew the agents of the French East India Company and its employees. They were familiar with them. Governor Estupin Labru had resided in Saint Louis for 17 years, and French traders had operated along the Senegal for more than 60. The British, by contrast, were strangers. No one in the lower Senegal Valley had much experience with them. At least at first, therefore, they might be difficult to manage. Who could know? At the same time, regime change in Saint Louis perhaps would restore the Atlantic trade in the Senegal Valley, which had declined precipitously over the previous two years from the moment in 1756 when Britain and France went to war. Uncertainty for sure, but there were new commercial possibilities for the Kingdom of Wallo if this new set of Europeans could be kept in their place. The residents of Saint Louis not the kingdom of Walla, but the people who actually lived on Saint Louis had no such ambivalence about the British presence. They contemplated the prospect of conquest with unmitigated dread. British rule likely would change the way of life for the Catholic, Francophone, Free African, and mixed race inhabitants of Saint Louis, perhaps bring an end to the cultural, commercial, and kinship ties with the French that had developed there over 80 years ties that provided the basis for a collective identity of the Habitants. Lebru and his council had their own and somewhat different concerns. They had anticipated a British attack, but at Garret, not Senegal. They could mount a defense of Saint Louis, but barely given the available resources. They could summon an impromptu militia from among the Habitants to assist the several dozen French soldiers healthy enough to fight. They could direct the three French sloops that, then in the river to harass the British as they tried to sail upriver. But with little gunpowder at their disposal, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to stop the expedition if the uh, British succeeded in crossing the bar. And if you look at the right of this map um, from the early 18th century, you'll see the bar, um, the Senegalese bar. Sorry. Camera, <laughs> uh, which I'll be referring to in a moment, this is the island of Saint Louis. Uh, the kingdom of Wallo is based on the mainland, uh, just uh, in the sort of this talk, in the sort of hinterland from uh, in the Senegal Valley. To capture the island of Saint Louis, the British fleet first had to reach it. The bar between the Senegal River and the Atlantic Ocean made this no easy task. Stories told later about the conquest stressed the dangers. The violent winds, the pounding surf, the barely submerged barriers of sand and stone, together they made entry treacherous even for the shallow draft boats that Samuel Touchett had provided. A young poet celebrated the courage required to make the attempt in the aftermath, where, in his words, the rocks like rows of all devouring teeth with horror rose. An experienced sailor on the expedition remembered his fear. A place so dreadful I never beheld, he wrote weeks after returning from Senegal. I expected every hour to be my last. Now the expedition had timed its arrival for one of the better moments to make the crossing. The Senegal crested, crests each April. Yet even in the best of conditions, making the passage required a kind of knowledge and experience that British ship captains, who were strangers to these waters, necessarily lacked. And even the French traders who came to Senegal each year relied upon local pilots, the Laptots of Saint Louis, to guide them over the bar. They needed local pilots. But Marsh's expedition obviously could expect no help from that quarter. Instead, they took fire from three French ships that La Brue had sent down to defend the river's entrance. At anchor then, just a mile offshore, Commodore Henry Marsh and his officers looked for their own way through. 
For the better part of four days, they gathered information and tested methods to make the crossing. Some of this time, wind gusts prevented measurement entirely. Quickly, the commanders realized that the larger ships would never clear the rocks. The best channels ran only 10 feet deep. Time, therefore, to experiment. Small craft attached from the Harwich set warps within the bar to pull the flat bottom boats through the surf, while the rest set down a covering fire to shield the mariners as they worked. More determined opposition from the French outpost would have made this difficult task impossible. God knows what would have happened, and an artillery captain wrote weeks later, if they had defended the place as they ought. The resident agents of the French East India Company, though, could not mount a defense. Unbeknownst to the British command, the French garrison stood on the brink of collapse. Indeed, this had been the situation for more than a year, as a desperate letter sent from Saint Louis to French East India Company headquarters in Brittany explained. No meal remained. Daily rations of meat and grain had fallen to a bare minimum. Wine stocks had been exhausted since February. Supplies of clothes and shoes dwindled rapidly. Without uniforms, the garrison at Gore now was, quote, quite naked. The governing council at Saint Louis had ordered scraps of sailcloth to be repurposed to provide the men with some form of cover. By April 1758, no accoutrements of French life remained in Saint Louis. The garrison subsisted on bird food, one trader wrote dismissively, of the millet that had become the unwelcome staple of the French diet. Before long, he predicted, even the gentlemen of the governing council at Saint Louis would have to fashion hats from tiger skins and shoes from ox hide. Soon, they would make their living not only by, not by trade, but instead by what they could extort with their rifles as raiders or as mercenaries. Soon they would live, look, and behave more like savages than Frenchmen. For France lay further away in the time of war than in the years of peace. The outbreak of hostilities in May 1756 left French merchants vulnerable to privateers. By 1757, it had become impossible to send goods and information to West Africa through the usual channels. Officials at Saint Louis neither could ship commodities from Senegal on French East India Company ships, nor receive supplies directly from company headquarters. Instead, they had to rely on Dutch neutrals for the carrying trade. Those ships, though, traded in and out of Texel in the Netherlands, instead of Brittany, where the company warehouses lay. And that circuitous route not only delayed commerce and communication, but also complicated the collection of the textiles necessary for the Senegal trade. The last French ship to reach Saint Louis had arrived in June 1757 and brought little relief. The Dutch neutrals that visited in February 1758 came with some wine and naval supplies, but mostly, it was reported, inedible biscuit um, and, instead, and no meal to make bread. The new sailcloth was welcome, but it had been cut to fit Dutch ships rather than French. In short, the employees of the French East India Company in Senegal had to make do with the goods that happened to reach them rather than those that they had requested. These various shortages would have mattered less if French officials had sufficient reserves to buy what they needed in the Senegal Valley's economy if they were less dependent upon exports. The principal European item of exchange here, though, was black cloth produced in Pondicherry in India, imported to France, and then re-exported to Senegal by the French East India Company. Because of the war in Europe, there suddenly was much less of that black cloth to go around. Officials in Saint Louis expected to receive 6,000 pieces a year to conduct the Senegal trade. The amounts delivered after 1756 rarely approached even half of that amount. One French ship brought 2,400 2, pieces in, in June 1757. The Dutch neutrals arrived six months later with another 1,000 pieces. This was a start, but hardly enough to keep the trade open. Because cloth functioned as currency, Senegalese traders from Wallow to Gollum and from Kayor to the southern Sahara refused to sell anything, slaves, ivory, gum, to the French in its absence. 
The iron bars and Spanish dollars in the San Luis warehouses were useless for these purposes. As a consequence, during 1757, French traders could purchase only a fraction of the available uh, trade commodities for sale in Senegal. They suspected correctly that rather more ended up with English interlopers 100 miles north on the uh, Atlantic shore of the Sahara at Port Etendere on the Mauritanian coast, which France now had no capacity to police because they had no naval presence at this point in, Af in Atlantic waters of West Africa. What French agents did acquire, they often purchased on credit, on the promise to send an English trader future supplies of cloth. We'll be getting it soon. Trust us, it is soon. Please. The rapid decline in cloth deliveries to Senegal affected more than the trade in commodities, the export trade. Company agents at Saint Louis sold cloth not only to buy exports, but also to cover their operating needs. They needed cloth to pay the customs duties that opened trade and permitted Frenchmen to travel upriver. Cloth paid for the oxen and the milk, which without access to France had become staples of the diet. By the end of 1757, wallow traders began to sell the food to the French on credit on the basis of French promises to deliver in the near future. But such promises all knew were increasingly unreliable if the French East India Company could not restore access to its own home ports. No one in the Senegal or its hinterland had feared the resident agents of the French East India Company. Their power was commercial rather than military. But the undermanned garrison, the undermanned garrison rarely ventured beyond the thinly fortified walls at Saint Louis. But now with their credit dwindling, there was a, the further possibility that no one would respect them either. The Trars at Emirate, based north of Senegal, had decimated villages in and, re, in and around the French fort at Podor in 1757, unafraid of reprisals or of the potential economic consequences. The Kingdom of Wallow threatened to increase the yearly customs and take over the government of Saint Louis. French officials worried correctly that the Kingdom of Wallow would abandon France should Britain attack. So this was the situation in Saint Louis as one by one, the British expedition's flat-bottomed boats tested the Senegal bar. On April 28th, a schooner and a converted two-masted fishing boat went through first. The Portsmouth went next and seemed to be out of danger once it cleared the bar, but broke a cable and ran aground on the mainland. And this is just the, if you look at the sort of, it's east because the map is tilted the wrong way, but they, um, these ships kind of uh, ended up beached in the area where it said La Les Salines. The Talbot experienced a similar fate, passing through the channel, but then driven to land by the wind and village on the beach next to the Portsmouth. The shipwrecked, the shipwrecked marines salvaged what they could, waded ashore, and quickly dug entrenchments in the sand. With limited ammunition, without cannon, tents, food, or drink, and cut off from the ships of war still bobbing beyond the bar and out of reach in the Atlantic, they lay defenseless on the beach. But the leaders of Walla chose to lay siege at San Luis rather than attack the stranded British soldiers. For the British Navy had shown itself to be superior at sea, and therefore best positioned to restore Atlantic trade. Le Brew, as a consequence, elected to consolidate what remained of his meager forces and defend Saint Louis from Wallow, <coughs> rather than press his advantage against the exposed British Marines on the beach. He ordered the three French sloops then in the river to retreat the 15 miles from the mouth of the bar back to Saint Louis to liberate the island. Uh, to liberate the island. That decision, in turn, allowed the British men aboard the Swift and Union to disembark, assist the machine, Marines grounded ashore. The beach men had anticipated an attack from the mainland. Tufton received from Wallow instead an offer of alliance. So this, the first British victory in the Seven Years' War, owed as much to Wallow military might as British command of the ocean, although no one has told the story that way then or since. Le Brew surrendered to the British expedition on April 30th, just seven days after Marsh's ship appeared off the coast of Senegal. In submitting to the British forces, he hoped that uh, uh, Major Mason would help his council negotiate a settlement with Wallop. 
their erstwhile allies that would allow the company to at least keep, the company employees to keep what remained of their property. The eventual terms reflected these priorities. The council asked for transport back to France and the right to carry their personal effects. They asked John Tufton Mason and his soldiers to make an inventory of the goods in the company's storehouses so that the headquarters would be able to itemize the losses. Lebru warned Mason that the wallow now occupying Saint Louis should be encouraged to return home to the mainland since given their numbers and military power, they could stop the execution of the treaty and prevent British command of the island. That suggestion led Mason into a prolonged negotiation with the neighboring princes that would decide the terms of occupation. This was not enough, though, for the Creole community of Saint Louis, who, with the most to lose, had contested the British landing, defended the island, and now faced under British rule not just a loss of property and religious liberty, but also potentially a loss of their political independence. As a consequence, the habitants briefly brought negotiations to a halt, insisting upon formal recognition as a free community and a pledge to be treated with honesty and civility before they permitted the British and French officers to set terms. So there are four different parties on Walla that are negotiating uh, this, handover of, um, uh, this handover from Britain to France. Marsh and Mason accepted the, agree the agreement readily. A truce with the French, peace with the established residents, and an alliance with the Kingdom of Walla suited their purpose. The British commanders insisted only on immediate and unfettered access to the stores and property of the French East India Company. The conquerors intended first to set up shop rather than to set down rules. Naval historian Julian Corbett, a century ago, dismissed the capture of Saint Louis as commerce destruction, a kind of smash and grab operation. Of little strategic importance, agreed the chronicler for the Royal Artillery many years later. <coughs> to them, and to many subsequent commentators, the African adventure seemed best suited for a cabinet of Georgian curiosities, rather than the central narrative of Anglo-French rivalry during the long 18th century. What came after appears to justify that assumption. The capture of Senegal, and one year later, the island of Gore, just a few miles south, soon was overshadowed by later, victor later British victories in Quebec, in Guadeloupe, in Havana, in India, which re would redirect the histories of North America, the Caribbean, and South Asia more generally. European overseas enterprise in the late, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and European overseas enterprise in the late 18th century. The British occupation of Saint Louis, by contrast, does not seem to mark the beginning of anything in particular. France would reclaim the island outpost in 1779 in the first year of its alliance with the Continental Congress during the American War for Independence. The two-decade British occupation of Saint Louis quickly would disappear from memory. Not long after, Parliament would spend nearly two decades debating just about every aspect of the British slave trade as it decided how to respond to public demands for abolition. The print record of those debates, of, those, of, of the studies, the investigations um, into Britain's African trade, as, some, as many of you will know in this room, are voluminous. Incredibly, though, in those thousands of pages of debate, of discussion and study, there's just about no mention of that first experiment in African colonization. It's not only that this is a venture that historians forgot and had no interest in, there was no interest in it in its immediate aftermath. It was as if it had never happened. This is in part, I think, well, just in part, because the synagogue adventure had actually little to do with the trade in slaves, at least at first. The House of Slaves on the island of Gore today, off the coast of Senegal, claims that millions pass through its door of no return. But thanks to two generations of highly detailed research into the demographics of the Atlantic slave trade, we know that only a fraction of slave ship voyages took on captives at Senegal or Goree. 
far more important <coughs> to the British and French slave trades were ports to the south and east in places that Europeans knew as the Gold Coast, the Slave Coast, the Bight of Biafra, which map maps roughly onto today's Ghana, Benin, and Nigeria. So the story of the British province of Senegambia is actually not a story about the slave trade, not for the most part anyway. Its history centers instead on a commodity that few think about today. On the eve of the Industrial Revolution, Gum Senegal became an essential ingredient in the dyeing and finishing of linens and silks across Western Europe. For European manufacturers hoping to compete with textiles imported from South Asia, no other mordant would do. Gum Arabic, which was more widely available from Mediterranean suppliers, worked well enough for a few of the more common finishes. But when in used in combination with blue and yellow dyes in particular, gum Arabic tended to ruin the fabric textile, textile makers had learned. There was only one place, though, to acquire gum Senegal, as far as European merchants knew anyway, on the Atlantic shore of present-day Mauritania, and along the northern banks of the Senegal River. There, the Trarza of the lower Senegal Valley and the rival Brachna, resident further east, presided over the land where the gum-producing acacia trees flourished. Whoever, therefore, conducted the Atlantic export trade from Mauritania and Senegal could command, in turn, the supply of gum Senegal to all of Europe. And you'll see these, this is a, a map from this area, and you'll see the sort of rendering of the gum trees uh, north of Senegal um, and to the, uh, you know, on the Atlantic shores. When I refer to the Trars of the Trarsian kingdom, uh, is the sphere of influence was here, and the Brockton's influence was further up the river in the Senegal, the wall that I was referring to. Um, the closer to uh, uh, Saint Louis and Goray, which is off the coast here. France monopolized exports from Senegal th th through, uh, through the first half of the 18th century, but only by defending its claim through the occasional use of force. Dutch traders managed to export significant quantities from uh, Argun and Portendick along the Atlantic shores of the Western Sahara during the 1710s. In the early 1720s, though, the French East India Company destroyed those outposts and forced the Netherlands to renounce all rights to trade there. It proved more difficult, however, to keep British interlopers away. The British government refused to acknowledge France's claim to sole possession of this traffic. The British Admiralty sometimes supplied armed escorts for, Brit for merchant ships seeking to trade at Port and Derrick. Unable to prevent British poaching on the gum trade, the saint Louis governor in 1740, the French governor, proposed an annual exchange to Britain's Royal Africa Company, who were resident at James Fort in the Gambia River. saint Louis would sell 180 tons of gum, this was the trade, to Britain each year, and receive 300 captives from the Royal Africa Company in return. French weren't buying slaves, they were buying gum. This would have the effect, he hoped, of discouraging British trade at Port and Dick, and in turn re reducing enforcement expenses for the French East India Company. The agreement held for a few years until the collapse of Anglo-French relations in the mid-1740s during the War of Austrian Succession, which put British access to gum Senegal in jeopardy once again. So this was how things stood when Thomas Cumming first approached British Prime Minister William Pitt with the scheme to steal the Senegal trade. The few references to Cumming describe him as a Quaker, oops, as a Quaker merchant from New York. But that description is true only in the loosest sense. Born in Edinburgh, the rootless Cumming lived in New York only briefly, had at best an indifferent career in trade, and was never officially acknowledged as a Quaker by the Society of Friends. The most detailed references to his life appear in a satire of Tomo Comingo, published in the Town and Country Magazine in 1774, 
and in the proceedings of a mock comic literary society based in Maryland known as the Tuesday Club. There he was known as Comey Pimp Frotenbras, which the editor of the Tuesday Club paper suggests implies a pompous facade, dissembling humor, tendency toward illicit trade, the caricature of the prototypical merchant who might also be a double agent for a competing authority, be it club, state, or foreign power. Let me just say it parenthetically, the editor of the Tuesday Club papers who characterizing uh, Cummings' nickname, club name, with this description, had no idea how accurately it captures his involvement in this particular venture. It's really kind of extraordinary. Thomas Cummings explained to Pitt that he had traveled to Port and Derrick several times as an agent in the gum trade for a London merchant house, that he had cultivated relations with the Trarzan, that they had special regard for him, that if appointed as His Majesty's agent there, he could forge an alliance with the emirate that would overthrow the French at saint Louis. There seems to be, have been some truth to this story, um, because Cumming had, in fact, made several, had made several ventures there. It's also very pretty clear that the Charza had recruited Cumming to serve as an agent for them to the court of George II. So throughout this history, it's not entirely clear. He's a, he is, in fact, operating as a kind of double agent. Cumming was, in his own words, made very sensible that the king, the Charza Emperor, Emir, and his subjects bore an implacable en en enmity to the French nation, just as the British did. The Emir had laid his commands on him, and the sense of ordering a subordinate is, is very important here, to acquaint his sovereign, King George, that if ever, and as soon as his majesty should declare war against the French king, and would send over a sufficient number of ships of war, he promised to direct and assist with all in his power particularly mentioning 17,000 of his men, if required, the said ships and subjects of England to reduce our king's subjections, the capital and other forts possessed by the French in the river Senegal. The Trazra, the Trazra Emirate had, in other words, invited Britain to conquer saint Louis. If coming, it promoted the scheme of Whitehall, he had, but it originated with, in fact, the Trazra leadership, who just then were engaged in a prolonged war with the Brockna, their neighbors, who resided several hundred miles uh, east along the northern banks of the Senegal. When Pitt's ministry collapsed in 1757, and after the other key members of the cabinet expressed skepticism about this venture, coming turns to other sources of support. The Senegal scheme was just the kind of venture likely to appeal to the Lancashire textile tycoon Samuel Tuchel. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of him. His wide range of commercial and financial ventures include shares in almost two dozen West Indian voyages annually, co-ownership of a Jamaican cotton plantation, and slave trading at Anamabo on the Gold Coast. As of 1752, he served as one of three Liverpool delegates to the Company of Merchants Trading to Africa. Perhaps most importantly, Touchett worked as the unofficial London representative for, La for Lancashire textile interests in their several schemes to expand production, reduce costs, and open new markets. In the 1740s, he had invested in the first projects to mechanize cotton production. In 1751, he had led the campaign by cotton and linen manufacturers to increase the volume and lower the price of Irish yarn. At the time of the Seven Years' War, Touchett was the most important textile lobbyist in London. In that capacity, he had long looked for opportunities to expand and diversify British enterprise in West Africa. He encouraged the cultivation of indigo and cotton on the Gold Coast at Cape Coast Castle, hoping more generally that West Africa would become the source of new supplies. Carolina produced too little indigo, he told the Board of Trade which meant that British manufacturers had to purchase it from France and Spain instead. Cotton presented similar problems. We have very little cotton now from the West Indies, so we take our cotton at great disadvantage from the Turks and other places. This is in the 1750s. He conceded that it might not be wise to cultivate land in West Africa, land that British subjects did not own, 
Still, he thought the experiment worth the risk, both because of the need and the potential returns. So by the time Cumming approached Touchett, late in 1757, he already had spent several years looking for new ways to develop traffic in Africa's natural produce, in what later generations would come to know as legitimate commerce. For Thomas Cumming, therefore, Samuel Touchett was the perfect partner. He appreciated the value of Gum Senegal to textile makers, had experience with and connections to the Africa trade, and liked to speculate on new or under, underdeveloped branches of commerce. Moreover, Cumming had terms for Touchett that he knew would be difficult to refuse. In the spring of 57, Pitt had promised Cumming command of the Senegal trade if the expedition succeeded. Exactly what Pitt meant by this, or whether he in fact could make such a promise at all, would be a subject of contention for several years after. But in any case, Cumming joined the expedition to Senegal, convinced that he in effect had a proprietary right over the trade in the event of its success. Rights that he could share with or transfer to touch it in exchange for financial aid. Sometime in late 57 or early 1758, then, Touchett agreed to underwrite the expedition's costs. He spent more than 10,000 pounds of his own money in exchange for a half share of Cummings' claim. That money went directly to the construction of the flat bottom boats that they used to get across the bar, and a portion of the supplies and the trade goods that would travel with the ships, sailors, and marines. So the financing of the 1758 venture to Senegal, the capture by um, Britain, um, owed far more to investments by government contractors, to private merchants, than it did to the British Treasury. Now, this promise of proprietary rights left the British government in a delicate position after the war. Coming in touch it, expected exclusive possession. Although Pitt, their patron, now was out of power in 1763. And Touchett was particularly stubborn about this. He viewed the expansion of the British Empire as an opportunity for rent-seeking. Earlier, he had tried to monopolize the importation of raw cotton. In 1749, he had joined a coalition of merchants hoping to secure exclusive control over the British trade to Labrador. Some years after the Senegal expedition in 1772, he would fix on an ambitious scheme to acquire mineral rights in and about Lake Superior. So the Senegal venture was very much in character. But British commercial interests, more generally, expected the command of Saint Louis to increase the supply of gum and drive down prices. Dependence upon a single supplier, even if that supplier was an Englishman, invited market manipulation and restricted access. So they petitioned against the proposed monopoly and in favor of a free trade in Senegalese gums. Skeptical of the very principle of monopoly, concerned about its practical effects on the gum trade, and influenced by the recent history of the Africa trade, which had led to the dissolution of the Royal Africa Company, Parliament vested control of the new Senegal River in the Company of Merchants Trading to Africa in 1764, quote, in the same manner and under the same regulations and subject to the same rules as the other forts and settlements on the coast of Africa are now vested in the same company. So you guys can't have a monopoly. We're just going to run this like we run all the other trading forts in West Africa. But it was one thing to occupy a trading post, something else altogether to make it viable. Saint Louis was not like the other British outposts along the West African coast. Keeping the trade open to British ships rarely, if ever, required, required a military presence. In the Bight of Biafra, in present-day Nigeria, there were no forts at all. In Benin, along the slave coast, the rulers of Ouida and Dalmey simply forbid Europeans from waging war with each other on their land or in their waters. British, French, Danish, Portuguese, and Brandenburg forts oops, lined the beach on the Gold Coast, but they had long since lost their importance as military installations. Those are lists of all the forts. You can see them sort of cheek by jowl um, along the Gold Coast. Only in Senegal and Gambia was Anglo-French rivalry acute. As a consequence, it seemed to require a different form of governance and administration. It was not clear at all that the slave traders who organized the commerce elsewhere in Africa could be trusted to defend Senegal. They needed a military solution to keep the, com the commerce open. 
So after a period of experimentation, Parliament declared the trading post at St. Louis and James Fort Gavia to be a province and appointed a royal governor to oversee it. In this way, the new province of Senegambia was meant to be governed somewhat like an American colony and certainly more than like the other African outposts. Now this, of course, when viewed in very broad perspective, was a creative moment in the constitutional history of the British Empire. Parliament assigned to the new province of Senegambia a governor, council, courts, and constitution in the same year that it also authorized rather different new governments for East Florida, West Florida, Quebec, and the Ceded Islands in the West Indies. The Senegambia project marks not only the first attempt at British rule in West Africa, it also represents a first experiment in crown colony government anywhere in the British Empire, a structure that would become increasingly common in the 19th century, but for which there were few precedents in the mid-18th. The British government made no attempt to populate the new African colony with British colonists. This was to be government without an elected assembly. <coughs> the institutional structure of the new Senegambia province, therefore, reflected the more general impulse to consolidate authority in the empire in the decade after the Seven Years' War, to ensure that overseas enterprise advanced the overarching interests of the state and secured uh, new commercial opportunities. Other aspects of the Senegambia adventure resembled developments elsewhere in the expanded empire as well. Just as British speculators schemed to seize new lands and revenue in India, in North America, and in the Caribbean in the 1760s, the appointed and the connected turned Senegambia into an opportunity for self-enrichment. Two examples will have to suffice to suggest both the parallels as well as the connections between Senegambia and the other acquired territories from the Seven Years' War. Anthony Bacon had started his career in commerce as a shipmaster in the service of the Quaker John Hanbury, a leading London tobacco importer. Initially, Bacon traded principally in Maryland, but in time, in the 1750s, he had begun to export Virginia tobacco as well and had developed an interest in the Spanish wine trade. His skill in the organization and management of overseas shipping eventually brought him to the attention of government, for during the Seven Years' War, Bacon became remarkably adept at securing government contracts. He supplied provisions to the British Navy and victuals to the British Army in the Quebec campaign in 1759. In the last years of the war, he pushed his way into Britain's new acquisitions in the West Indies, in St. Vincent, in Tobago, in Dominica, in Grenada. There, his contracting business included supplying food to the British Army and Navy and leasing them slave laborers to assist in the construction of fortifications. This guy was everywhere. In the same period that he helped make the new empire and the Ceded Islands work, he received the contract to provision the new British garrison stationed at the base of the Senegal River. And from 1759 to 1767, he served as the principal conduit between the treasury officials in London and British appointees stationed at St. Louis. <coughs> For Anthony Bacon, the new acquisitions in Africa and the new acquisitions in the West Indies were of peace. And then there was Charles O'Hara the first and longest serving governor of the province of Senegambia. The Board of Trade directed O'Hara to establish a government, to construct forts, and promote trade. They also forbid him from trading on his own account or trafficking in slaves. O'Hara liked to build forts, but showed no interest in or capacity for the delicate <coughs> work of governance or the facilitation of peaceful trade. Almost immediately, he became enamored instead with the prospect of building not just a colony, but also an empire in the Senegal River Valley. O'Hara predicted that in time, Senegambia would, quote, become one of the richest colonies belonging to his majesty. That British colonists would, in his words, extend over every part of this continent, continent that was worthwhile to settle. Less than a year after his arrival, he had devised plans to establish British colonists several hundred miles upriver near what he thought to be extensive gold mines and prodigious quantities of rice, flax, cotton, indigo, and tobacco. For O'Hara, the plantations of North America and the West Indies were the important reference point. He rarely made any mention of the gum trade. He had no interest in it. What had been a tiny trade in slaves from South Senegal, so moreover, suddenly began to flourish, with many ships destined for the nascent plantation economy of Dominica where O'Hara, just as it happened, had just bought plantations. 
Thanks to an extraordinary database assembled by a team of researchers over the last 25 years, the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, some of you will know about, it's possible to document individual streams of that traffic in minute detail. Sixteen slave ships took captives from Saint Louis during the last two decades of French residence there, about one a year. During the 20 years of British occupation, there were, one, there were 178 slave ships, more than a tenfold increase. British merchants, in other words, effectively created an Atlantic slave trade from a place where there scarcely had been one before. How this happened is still a bit unclear, although it's quite clear that O'Hara had a lot to do with it. There's evidence that he either assisted or stimulated conflicts between the Brachna and their neighbors that had the intended effect of generating thousands of captives. In the end, 27,000 men, women, and children were shipped to every corner of the British Empire in the Americas, but disproportionately to mainland North America, particularly South Carolina, and to the untilled soils on the new plantations in the colonies recently captured by British forces, particularly Dominica and Grenada. This sudden and rapid growth in slave exports from Senegal helps explain an important anomaly in the data on slave ship insurrections that often has been noted, but never to this point explained. Several years ago, slave trade historian David Richardson observed that uprisings on slave ships occurred most frequently on the Upper Guinea coast and spiked dramatically during the third quarter of the 18th century from 1751 to 1775, just at the time of the, of the settlement of the rise and fall of this British province of Senegambia. Yet, the several articles that deal with this sort of growth in slave ship insurrections at this time in this place make no mention of the fact that there was actually a British colony there that was making mischief throughout the Senegal Valley. Saint Louis, though, was not St. Kitts or any of the other plantation colonies that Charles O'Hara seemed to have in mind. He and the rest of the British command never quite understood that although they were in office, they were never really in power. A detailed, a detailed picture of his personal rule as it affected one community emerges from a remarkable petition arrest, uh, addressed to George III in 1775, just as British authority in North America was on the verge of collapse. Fifteen of the Saint Louis habitants, led by the mayor of the town, Charles Thevenot, enumerated O'Hara's transgressions and declared for their own rights at some length. The governor's unsteady management of relations with the Trars of Brachna and Wallow meant that, quote, we are constantly in disturbance. O'Hara permitted slave ship captains to take British soldiers rather than local laptops on slaving expeditions up the Senegal River, with predictably disastrous results. He seems to have regarded the payment of tribute as beneath him and his office. As a consequence, the Damo of Cayor and the Trars of Moors, the chief suppliers of corn and beef to Saint Louis, refused to provision the island, a situation that, quote, had never been known before. This left the residents of Saint Louis increasingly dependent upon supplies and supplies from Europe. More generally, O'Hara seems to have placed much of the local economy in his control. He not only encouraged the slave trade, the petitioners reported, but also reserved to himself first preference for those acquired. He ignored the terms of the 1758 capitulation when he found them inconvenient. He forbid Catholicism and wanted to abolish our church. He took houses and yards and gives them to what, whom he pleases. Customary law had no standing with him, the petitioners explained. Eight days after his arrival, he had broken the council of the inhabitants put in place by his predecessors. He seized and shipped to the Americas the slaves of those residents who displeased him. He took their cattle as well as their homes and slaves and then destroyed the cattle to demonstrate their dependence upon his will. For these reasons, they concluded, his power and authority must be very great. O'Hara was in the habitants telling an overmighty subject who had taken for himself not only the property and persons of the island, but the prerogatives of a king. The Senegalese petitioners then hoped to put themselves under the protection of George III to seek relief as his majesty's royal subjects. In this way, they unknowingly participated in a broader effort across the expanded empire to use the authority of the crown against the ambitions of new British settlers. The habitants made frequent reference to the ways that O'Hara refused to honor their status as free peoples. He tended to treat them, instead, they explained, as subject peoples rather than subjects of the crown. <coughs> 
This emphasis upon subjection helps explain the various references in the Habitat's petition to O'Hara's insulting behavior, to his intermittent declarations that he did not care anything about us. O'Hara found it difficult to view the Habitats as deserving the liberty and property that they possessed. O'Hara, they stated, ignored or outlawed opposition. Reluctantly, some had taken O'Hara up on the offer to abandon San Luis, and they left their homes to seek sanctuary on the mainland. This was the beginning of the end for the province of Senegambia. The inability to control a colonial appointee compromised the security of Britain's first province in Africa. Secretary of State George Germain recalled O'Hara in 1776 because he knew that alienating the local elite would destroy British trade there. They found that he had governed arbitrarily without the advice and consent of council that he had, quote, invaded the property rights of the inhabitants, that he distressed the inhabitants for want of fresh provision. Germain relieved O'Hara from his office, but in his absence, governance of Senegambia descended into a frenzy of backbiting and dissension. It would number among the casualties of the American Revolution. By then, though, the British settlement in Saint Louis had fallen to ruin anyway. A malaria epidemic nearly wiped out the small garrison that remained when the French arrived in 1779. Few in Britain mourned the loss when saint Louis was restored to France with the settlement of 1783. The treaty that confirmed American independence brought as well an end to the hope of conquering the Senegal, Senegal Valley, of establishing a British colony 100 miles upriver, of navigating the Senegal as if it were the Hudson, and occupying saint Louis as if it was Manhattan. The surrender of the least governable acquisitions in 1763, East Florida, West Florida, and Senegambia, would be one part of the price of peace. So this book is a history of the rise and fall of a colonial experiment, with failure as its governing theme. My intention is to provide a contrast to how much of the history of the British Empire and British overseas enterprise tends to get written. There are almost always stories of accomplishment and achievement. People have ideas, they publicize them, they win supporters, they confront obstacles, they overcome them, and produce something like what they intended. It matters not whether the author likes the adventurers or is writing to denigrate them. In either case, the story tends to focus on achievement. This instead is meant, at least to an extent, to be the history of intentions gone awry, of the rather significant distance between what people set out to do and what they accomplished. And one reason to make this point is to demonstrate in a new way what most who know this period understand but rarely develop in much depth. The British presence in Africa in the era of the slave trade, indeed the European presence in Africa, depended entirely upon the willingness of the various African peoples to have them there. If it suited their needs and interests, the European traders were permitted to stay. When it did not, they were asked or forced to leave. British traders in Senegal rarely got their way on the timing or location of markets, on prices, or on something as simple as the provision of food, unless their African partners decided to cooperate. The tendency to project 19th and 20th century European technological and commercial superiority back onto the 18th century is to invert the power dynamics at work, at least in the Senegal. In this way, the province of Senegambia was in fact quite typical. Indeed, given the precedents available to the British, what's remarkable, remarkable is less the failure of the province of Senegambia but that the venture ever should have been tried in the first place. There's almost no chance that this could have succeeded, at least on the terms in which they were going about. When set alongside the other ways the British operated on the West African coast, the project was wholly out of character. Given British history, experience, knowledge, and skills, there was no chance, little chance, that it could turn out well. And there's, throughout this history, a kind of stumbling through quality to the venture. Improvised. 
the brainchild of a handful of aspiring monopolists, really a pair of aspiring monopolists. <laughs> the official investment in the project was never complete, was far from substantial. When the initiators didn't get the monopoly they expected, they too divested from the venture, as the risks seemed to outweigh the rewards. One gets a sense from the record that a decade into the project, no one really much cared about the colony. It stumbled along because it simply could not be surrendered, if only as a matter of pride. But it's a useful reminder, I think, of the way the institutions, projects, experiments of various kinds can persist, at least formally, long after their period of usefulness, long after it truly matters to anyone in particular. Prince Senegambi was orphaned before it was abandoned. The ease with which everyone involved simply forgot the adventure indicates, I think, this absence of emotional investment. This puts the death and destruction that accompanied the colonial experiment in a somewhat different light. There can be a tendency in writing about empire or colonial settlement, perhaps war in general, to valorize those who perish in the service of a good cause, who make way for progress in one form or another. This way of writing about war has its own problems, obviously. But in any case, it also leaves us unequipped to deal with the history of those places where hundreds thousands were sent to their death knowingly for no purpose whatsoever. Here less interested in those who sent them there than in those who went. What they understood when they boarded the transports for Goree or San Luis. What it was like to watch a neighbor waste away horribly and to know that the horror would find you next. The engineer at the Tower of London designated for service at St. Louis in 1758, hung himself in his office rather than agree to participate in the expedition. And this brings me back to the matter of obscurity with which I began. By any measure, by most of the measures that tend to matter anyway, Saint Louis was a marginal place, marginal to British and French overseas trade, marginal in its, uh, over, to the overseas rivalry of those two powers, marginal to the Atlantic slave trade, marginal to the history of Islam in West Africa. Yet for the French and English garrisons who lived and lost their lives there, for the habitants who made it home, for the peoples of Senegal who relied on Saint Louis for access to European goods or made fortunes from the trade, for the rapidly growing number of men and women and children exiled from the Senegal Valley through the slave trade, it was not a periphery, not an obscurity, but instead the very center of the world. Thank you. I am so sorry to have gone on uh, 10 minutes longer than I was supposed to. It is a sign of being very much out of practice and perhaps a little over enthusiastic. So we have a little bit of time for questions, I think, or discussions, objections, um, recommendations. Yeah, Jen. I have a couple, two points of one was, you know, you say that the colony was of no interest and was like, sort of an abandoned project. But so at this period, you said that there was a handful of increase in slaves going through. Yes. How does that match up? I mean, who were the, who, who were the slave slavers here? It's a great interest? question. It's a great question. And believe it or not, for in the interest of time, I'd cut that out. <laughs> um, so one thing that's interesting about the slave trade uh, from Saint Louis in this period is that the men who drive it are different from those who uh, predominate in the British slave trade elsewhere. So it's principally traders from London. London's uh, position in the slave trade declined steadily over the course of the 18th century trade. First it was Bristol, then it was Liverpool. Something like two thirds to three quarters of the slave traders um, of, who sent ships to Saint Louis are London merchants. Almost all of them had no history in the slave trade before this, before uh, the capture of Senegal. So in the same way that that traffic is serving principally plantations that are at the, let's turn the peripheries again, at the periphery of the plantation world, the new settlements in Dominica and Grenada, 
or South Carolina, places that the Liverpool and Bristol merchants are not serving extensively. It's London merchants who are carrying Sondalese slaves to these places that are desperate for, slave, desperate for laborers but are not well served by the principal traders. So part of the story that I have to sell, tell is a story about new men entering a new traffic <coughs> to serve new commercial opportunities in new plantations after the 70s. What was the strategy of sowing this intent a new strategy? Was this so, you, so this did not happen anywhere else that the British operated. Uh, and, you know, the story is slightly different in Benin. Biafra and Benin and the Gulf Coast, which are the three regions that the British traded in, each have slightly different dynamics. But what they all share is that the British merchants effectively arrive, wait on the coast for suppliers to bring captives down to them. And O'Hara seems to have, in both his ambitions and impatience, decided that he was going to stimulate what was not, in fact, happening. Um, this is a part of the project that I'm not, I've not mastered yet. It's pretty clear what happened, but I've not been able to sort of... So, and part of it, I think, is a little bit of a... Um, it reflects a assumption that, you know, military man assumption, I'm in Africa, Africa produces slaves, let's go get some slaves, rather than the sort of commercial world that the French had created, which was about trading tropical commodities. So I did research and teach African topics. And oh, great. I, yeah. When I saw your title, I was you can tell me everything deeply embarrassed. I, got I don't know about this place. So I went to all my big, big books and was looking and looking and looking. And you're so right. It's just not there. It's, it's incredible. So thanks for, for that. Uh, um, my question is simply, uh, can you give a better sense of the numbers? Like how many habitats were there? How many in, in garrison? It's a good question. Yeah. So the rough population of the habitats this period is between between 2,000 and fluctuates. Um, the garrisons, the British garrisons, are always in the dozens. Um, so this whole notion that this is a colony province is really just a kind of a glorified military outpost. Um, it's all men. There are no English, British women go out there. And if, there are a few partners who go briefly, but there are no British women there at all. Um, and the population of the mainland, I don't know. Um, I don't know that actually anybody, anybody has done that uh, demographic work. But you're, you're quite right. I mean, I'm still, I've been thinking about and talking about this project off and on for a long time. It's kind of, kind of captured my imagination. And part of it is just simply, you know, in the early 21st century, you wouldn't think there was a colony in the British Empire that not only didn't have a history, but nobody had ever heard of. Um, and so that part of it is a really interesting challenge of just trying to piece together what is in fact, I mean the other part of it is just that there is so much material, which I also didn't expect. I thought if I was going to be dealing with scraps, um, and instead it's, uh, it's quite a lot. So, but the, you know, some of the ways actually been studied and written about in its French period. Um, you know, somewhat extensively. But even those who write about the trade of the seniors and the, and the sort of the um, mixed race elite that's resident there, they skip right over the British period. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll mention that there was a British period, um, but it's like those 25 years just disappear. And the, the British garrison, they must have consorted with the seniors. They did, they did. I don't, again, this is a part that I really don't have a hand um, there's going to be a whole chapter of the book that deals with um, social relations between um, the garrisons and the habitats. And uh, there's quite a bit of material to do that, but I just think not. That's, that's part of the work that I'm saying. Yeah. Um, thank you. It was really interesting talk. Um, and I wanted to ask you about the history of the Yeah. commerce, in particular, this um, the acacia trees in the Amazon, and that sort of 
So I have two, two questions. One, that part sort of dropped out, and I'm wondering what happens with the, the gum Senegal. Yeah. And two, that the sleeper strike did seem to be much more significant than you suggested. It beginning. becomes significant. Right. Um, and I had a question that you, you talked about the, that, you know, how, Clearly, one of the things you're grappling with is how does this fit into that larger story, right? The segue, then to Jeff's question, I mean, it seems like there's the dynamics here that are not present elsewhere that are interesting. In the sparkling uprisings that you noted, yeah. um, that have been documented, if, if that is a, a, um, a rise in the number of uprisings yeah. sort of per ship and not just because there's an increased number of people, is there something particular about the way that slaves are being, uh, or that people are being enslaved in this area right. that creates a different dynamic um, yeah. and leads to one Yeah, so uh, the short answer is that there is a, I'm going to not talk about it at all, it's fundamental to the story, um, is that there is a, a, uh, the right terms for it, a revival, intensification. It's amazing, an uh, uh, Islamic revolt um, in Fudatora, uh, where partially as a response, that's the only reason why this happened, but partially as a response to the dynamics of the British presence, um, there is a consolidation in the Upper Senegal River Valley of a religious state um, that and this is a, this is this is a principally Muslim area but it's not um, these details are not fresh in my head so I'm not going to be able to get the, the descriptive terms correct but that state one of its purposes is to actually stop the dynamics that O'Hara has launched um, so my colleague Butch Ware at the University of Michigan State been writing the sort of Senegalese side of this, has described a um, essentially, essentially a kind of a, uh, an independence movement in 1776 in Senegal, which is in part, in his telling, I think correctly, an anti-slavery movement. Because what they're trying to do is prevent um, Muslims from being enslaved by uh, British Protestants. Uh, and so there's this whole, and also to prevent, basically to make it difficult for those Muslim traders who might be inclined to do this to recognize it as being essentially sacrilegious. Uh, so, couldn't talk about this either, but there's the, the, the warfare in the Upper Senegal River Valley is extensive. I mean, it's quite clear that there is um, between the Wallow and the Brock, the Wallow and the Brock, and then uh, this new um, state of Fudatora, there's a really intense conflict over trade and political authority in the valley. And O'Hara is trying to play these different groups off of each other. They're also using him, too. So the slave ship interruptions, I understand, as being partly a legacy of that violence upbringing. Um, you're quite right that I started off saying it wasn't about slavery, and then I made it all about slavery in the end. Uh, I think that reflects a certain sort of uncertainty in my own mind about the story has, has so many different pieces. Um, it matters that this place matters not principally because of the slave trade. And so one way to understand it is that the slave trade, at least for the British, becomes a kind of vortex that just kind of pulls everything into it. It's not true for the French, who were quite clear about the split areas for gum, Gold Coast is for slaves, Benin is for slaves. Um, but, so there's a kind of a gravitational pull, I think, for the British there, um, and a unwillingness to, be, now, having said that, the natural question that follows, what happened to gun trade, as, as you kind of asked during that two decade period? And again, the short answer is I don't really know. Um, it's pretty clear that um, supplies to British merchants increased. I mean, they did benefit in ways that have been much more difficult under French rule. But the other thing that happened was that the French started doing exactly what the British had done, which is that they started trading on the Mauritanian coast as interlopers with the Charza and funneling it you know, that way rather than into the Senegal Valley. So 
The whole thing was a little, the whole thing of IBM monopolizing this was kind of a fiction because there were basically two outlets, and if you controlled one, you all really had to control both, and no one ever invested the kind of infrastructure required to really control both parts of the, both parts of the coast. But in terms of volume of the gum trade, uh, I don't know yet. I mean, honestly, there's more that I, there's a lot more that I don't know than what I do now. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was just curious about, um, you mentioned earlier on your talk about like diplomatic relations between like Europeans and Africans in this area. So um, yeah. I'm wondering like, when it comes to these particular individuals, like how is it that, especially like, like I guess like African diplomats at this point in time, like how they appear in the archive or yeah. in the sources and like what, like what's the nature of like a relationship or, or like how these conversations about like people like playing each other off of each other, yeah. like, like especially when it comes to sort of like indigenous diplomats, I guess. Yeah. How, like, yeah, how does that sort of operate in the archive? Like, how do you see that? What do you think that? It's a really good question. Um, so, the long petition that I read at the end is one of the few instances of a text yeah. produced by um, local elites that are addressed, is addressed directly. And not only that, but they actually designate one of their number and you know, trust owner, obviously. Uh, they designate one of their number to travel to London, to Whitehall, um, and talk to the Board of Trade, basically explain, testify to what's going on. That's unusual. As far as I know, that's the first time that a uh, representative of a West African state attended the British court in person to make a request, demand. Um, most of the sources uh, come, most of the material I'm drawing on anyway so far, uh, are reports by British or French interlocutors who are describing the conversations that they have. Uh, so then the question is, you know, how obviously how reliable are they? Um, and there's a lot of different ways to answer that. But having, the one thing is that they, because they are trying to, um, that they're responsible for conveying some sense of what's happening on the ground, uh, they do often provide a great deal of detail about who's doing what. Um, it's always easier to be confident about what's happening than what's in the minds of people who are being described. Um, and so there's some speculation on my part. I'm also drawing upon uh, you know, the work of Africans who work on these different um, you know, groups as well. Some of the, the best documentation, and most useful documentation, is about customs duties. Because you get a whole run of treasury records by detailed accounts of who gets paid what, how often, in what way, and for what purpose. Gifts that are given to different and gifts. I mean, basically, you can't do anything until you pay all the right people off, right? So all of that, all of that accounting is is highly is all it's all there. So that aspect of it is very easy. To, it's the qualitative stuff um, that's a little bit. It's actually there's actually quite a bit of it, but what you do with it, yeah, it requires a little bit more. So, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, Directions uh, that stimulates me to uh, think about one question uh, I had regarding the uh, point being made of the complaint of the inhabitants that uh, they were very concerned about maintaining their Catholic religion. No. One of the complaints they make is that the Sahara is suppressing their religion. No. You also alluded here to uh, questions. 
there's a symbol, there's this, this one's a one little symbolic anecdote because the, John Mason, he takes the baptismal font, the sort of out of the Catholic Church on San Luis, he puts it on a ship, and he, it's now in New Hampshire, it's a church in New Hampshire, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, as a trophy of the caption. And the sense of having, they very quickly decide that the Church of England is going to be established, and so there's, a, there's an Anglican minister that's there. Um, there. That doesn't go very well, and so they actually briefly try to recruit the, um, the, the Anglican minister at Cape Coast Castle, who's African. They try to get him to come to Senegal, and make the than this guy. Right, and so there's a there's a there's clearly a, a story about collisions between Protestant and Catholic on some of And one of the things I'm obviously trying to do is to suggest that this is taking part in a world where these things are happening in other places too. Yeah. Right? I mean, obviously, they come back. exactly. I mean, so, but there but there are all of these interesting resonances, um, and without homogenizing, it's a very different story, but. This tendency to regard this Africa stuff as oh, it's all that really different. It's very much in the minds of these British guys. They're thinking they're making these connections, even if historians are not. But the, the Islamic part of it is actually really crucial. Um, and you know, it's not. Um, I'm going to have to weave it more clearly into the structure of the book itself because trade operate along Islamic networks. And not only that, um, the, it was Marabouts who were the principal traders, right? So the separation in the West between religion and trade is not nearly as clear in this region as it is. And so I've got to take all of that. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, curious a little bit about the, the French side. Um, yeah. I mean, are the, are the French, or do they have spies among them? Are they, yeah. are they sort of regular, you know, papers and the French ministry showing, yeah. you know, we're still looking for a chance to take this area back? So, yeah. I didn't get a chance to talk about this either, but uh, after Senegal was taken, they went to the uh, And at the peace, uh, as part of the settlement of 1763, uh, Butte's ministry decided to return Goray to France part of the strategy of not, hopefully, preventing a future war. Um, those who knew the region knew that that was a horrible idea from a military and strategic point of view. Goray could easily be a, a place from which you could launch military um, attacks on uh, Saint Louis, you could attack the Gambia River. It was, it was a, um, it became a kind of strategic resource for France for this whole period. And so the thing I mentioned to you, I mean, one of the things that I've discovered is that uh, there are, for some subjects, more details about what's going on in the British garrison and the French records than there are in the British records. Because O'Hara is not reporting everything that he's up to. But the French government, who is quite clear that they're going to take this back as soon as the next war starts, they're studying it extensively. And they've got contacts you know, all throughout the region. They've been there for eight years. Um, and you know the European language, and there is a European language that's in play. It's French, not English, right? So their capacity to spy, undermine, uh, sabotage uh, is extensive you know, all throughout the French uh, art, the colonial archives, or the of colonial archives, the French records of Senegal during this period of time. All these intelligence reports <coughs> about what's going on uh, in Sahara. Yeah. We almost out of time, but I'll just quickly ask this question. The question of uh, crown colonies. Yeah. Uh, the success of crown colonies in the 19th century, 1860 onwards, seems to be based on this global circulation of administrators, bureaucrats, governors. Yes. There is an apparatus existing that supports crown colonies. Yes. And is the story of failure here, therefore, uh, a lack of this global apparatus of Great the existence point. Of, of crown colonies. Great it's, point. It's an experiment without any basis to back up. And, and they really didn't know what they were doing. Um, I also think the level of effort, to put it crudely, was very, very low. Uh, 
so O'Hara um, was uh, sent there because he had been uh, in Morocco in Gibraltar earlier as a kind of emissary. Uh, so the idea that he knew something kind of like that's kind of somewhat nearby here. Like, you know, this is not this is not the imperial mind or the imperial state of the 19th and 20th century. And this is a very uh, uh, unrefined level of administration. Um, and they also don't have O'Hara on a leash at all. I mean, so once he gets there, basically, he does whatever he wants to do. Uh, and it takes a long time. Basically, the sort of the, the threat of war um, and, you know, essentially a revolt in St. Louis is going we ought to, like, bring this guy home and fire him. Uh, but O'Hara's actually because then he ends up, what they do, they send him immediately after he's dismissed from Senegal, they send him to Virginia. And he ends up becoming uh, deputy Charles Cornwallis in the last phase of the American Revolution. And it's actually O'Hara who uh, surrenders to George Washington in Yorktown in 1781. Uh, he then ends up later in his career in Gibraltar, uh, where he also is present for really bad British defeats at the hands of the post. This is a guy who actually lost a lot. Like everywhere he went, he <laughs> Disaster seems to follow, um, but he kept getting reappointed. So, anyway, I think we are at the time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'm sorry for going.